Live.com, the legislative hour with your hosts, Bart Smith and Kevin Hall. Good afternoon and welcome to this week's edition of the Iowa Legislative Hour. I am your host, Kevin Hall. Art Smith is not able to join us this week, but we do have two special guests in the building. Uh, first, our regular guest, uh, Brad Zahn, State Senator from Urbandale. Brad, good to see you again. Thank you. It's good to be here. And a new visitor to the show this week from Oskaloosa, State Senator Ken Rosenboom. Senator, welcome. And thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Glad to have you here. Uh, we do this with every first-time guest who's been on the show. Uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Give us a little bit of your background and, and about the, the district that you cover. Okay, great. Uh, wasn't prepared for that, but I should be able to figure <laughs> that out, shouldn't I? Uh, born and raised in the Oscoos area, farm boy. I was in ag business for 30 years in Oscoos with feed, fertilizer, and grain. Uh, still a farm boy at heart. I do uh, farm with my brother on a limited basis yet. We do own some livestock buildings together. Okay. And I uh, have two children, uh, a little spread out. My uh, son's in the U.S. Army. When he's not in Afghanistan, he's either in Alaska or North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And my daughter married an Australian. So my daughter and grandchildren live 10,000 miles oh southwest of here. Wow. So we try to get there when we can. Yeah. Uh, 40th district, new district, of course, mm -hmm. it includes all of Mahaska County, all of Monroe County, all of, uh, uh Appanoose County, part of Wapalo and part of Marion. So if I can use the town, Centerville, Albia, wrap around Ottumwa, Oscillus and Pella. Hmm. And, uh, you were on the Mahaska County board of supervisors That's correct. and decided to run for the state Senate in 2012 and were successful. Congrats That's on correct. that. Thank you, sir. Uh, Brad, what's it been like, uh, serving with this? this young freshman senator here. He is doing an outstanding <laughs> job. Uh, the the people in his district are rep represented very well. He's a good listener, good learner, and uh, has really blossomed this year. Hmm. I've, uh, you know, he had some testimony on the floor here a couple months ago, got a lot of attention on, and uh, he's just a great person. And we're really, really excited. I'll tell you one thing that's, uh, to give him credit is, that he was potentially going to be running against an incumbent, uh, mm -hmm. Tom Riley, and Tom Riley decided not to run against him. So uh, he's comes with a lot of credibility, and the people down there when I campaign for Congress just love him to death. So uh, I can see why he got elected, and certainly uh, he's doing an outstanding job in the Senate. And then Riley wound up running for your old seat on the Board of Supervisors. That's correct. There's been a little interesting politics in Oskaloosa. Well, I, last think, year. I think you got the better the better end of that deal. Sure. Well, I feel good about it. So, <laughs> and I brought my fan base along. Brad's yeah. Yeah. There, so. yeah. Um, he mentioned the testimony you gave on the Senate floor right. a couple months ago, and uh, you did another version of that um, at the Republican Party of Iowa's uh, Celebrate Life event. Tell it. I don't want you to give the whole the whole speech, but tell us a little bit about uh, what you were talking about there and, and why the life issue is so important to you. Well, yeah, thanks. I uh, I thought about that coming here. I obviously, I can't take the time to tell the whole story, and I don't know how to tell half the story, <laughs> but I'll sum it up this way. Well, we do have an hour, so. <laughs> my, uh, my wife and I, many years ago, uh, had one biological child and wanted a second. We were not able to have a second child okay. for... Um, for a long time and then we went uh, the adoption route and through a series of events and I think through God's guiding we simply were led to a place called the Lighthouse in Kansas City. That's our story. My, our son's story was that his um, birth mother when she conceived him was 15 years old from Minnesota, was uh, obviously pregnant. Mm -hmm. She was on drugs, heavily drinking had been kicked out of her home and uh, no father in sight for this young baby. So it would have been, and I'm sure she was counseled probably to uh, terminate the pregnancy, but somehow she found herself, uh, found her way to the lighthouse in Kansas City where they took care of her, uh, delivered her baby, put him up for adoption, and that's where we came in. So now our son is a 25-year-old uh, Army paratrooper and... Uh, my challenge that day on the Senate floor was to, uh, uh, for everyone to listen to the voice of the unborn child. Um, and the reason I did that when I did was uh, that very week, uh, my son who had just uh, at that time was in Alaska, um, 
he and his new wife had begun searching for his birth mother for family medical history reasons. So on Tuesday of the prior week, uh, um, we were sent an email with the picture of Matt's birth, birth mother. So that's the first time we had seen her. And then on Wednesday, uh, Matt's uh, wife called his birth mother, uh, and she was ecstatic to hear something about her son. Hmm. And then on Thursday, which was Valentine's Day, Matt called his birth mother and talked to her. And I guess my uh, uh, my finishing line on that went something like this, that when uh, his birth mother picked up the phone, instead of hearing the silent, haunting voice of an unborn child that she might have terminated 25 years ago, she heard the strong voice of her firstborn son. And I think there's a message there. I, I spoke earlier about the the voice of the unborn child. Mm -hmm. Some people can't seem to hear that voice, but it's out there. And uh, as in our situation, we hear that voice loud and clear, my wife and I. Um, but I think it's I think that voice is deafening to some. We hear stories of of young ladies that have aborted children, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we want to gloss over the the pain and the um, devastation that can do to people. So um, that's what the story was about. Wow. And I already took too much time. No, but, no, uh, no, no, that was great. It's a great story. It really is. Um, has there been a face-to-face -face meeting yet or, or any talk? About no, it? Matt since then has moved from Alaska to North Carolina. She is living in Kentucky. Okay. Matt also discovered he has four half siblings. Wow. And there has been some telephone and texting uh, communication hmm. I don't know about a face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, there's a lot of dynamics at play sure. there. Uh, so, and and uh, at 25 years of age, that's a decision for him and his wife to right. make. And uh, I suspect it'll happen sometime. And we're not threatened by that at this point. So. Right, gotcha. Amazing story. Where's he at in North Carolina? He's at Fort Bragg. Okay. Just moved there uh that's Three weeks ago. Right next to my old hometown, Fayetteville, North Carolina. Oh, yeah. So, yeah small he's world. Spring Lake, I think they call mm -hmm. it. Yep. Yep. Uh, yep. That's uh, Spring Lake people went to my high school. So Sure. And he's uh, maybe heading back to Afghanistan for the third time, it sounds like, this summer. Wow. So. Wow. We're very proud to have him uh, serve our country. Thank you for that Thank story. You. And, you know, just as a follow-up, I will tell you, I typically don't read the Our Republican unless <laughs> Sundays are going on, because you do a great job. Thank you. Uh, but I, it was brought to my attention today a video that was online about Dr. Car uh, Carhart. Mm -hmm. um, every Iowan should see that video and walk away from that video just sick to their stomach. And this is the reason why, and it kind of touches, I don't know if you saw that video I, I saw the headline. I've not taken the time I, to look at it's it. It's disgusting. Yeah. That guy's a murderer. And you ought to just see what, you know, they had someone in there that did some videotaping. And I thought that was put together. And I give kudos to Craig Robinson for writing that story. But mm -hmm. that's a story that needs to be said. And, and you have an incredible story to share as well. So. And, you know, there have been numerous efforts this year in the House and the Senate from Republicans to try to get something done on the life issue, whether it's personhood, uh, whether it's stripping, stripping taxpayer funding uh, for abortions. Uh, so far, you know, nothing is happening. It, how frustrating is, is that for you? Well, it's frustrating. I, you know, Brad's been, this is his ninth year, I think. It's my first year. I did not come here with, uh, especially since I'm the minority, with... Uh, high in the sky uh, expectations of changing that. Mm -hmm. But I do, uh, and, and this is part of the reason I told that story, I want, I want to confront those that don't take this, uh, this issue ser as seriously as I think they should. I want to confront them with the reality of what abortion is, what options there are to abortion, such as adoption. Uh, Senator Sorensen a few weeks ago uh, also touched on that, I think, in a very, uh, he, he challenged uh, people to look at the science. You know, when, mm -hmm. when we were young and the argument, uh, we didn't have as much science, I think, to support the contention of, of the reality of that uh, fetus mm -hmm. that, that some people want to go, the reality of that baby at a very early age, it's the a, heartbeat. It's a, yeah, it's a big difference when you can My, see the ultrasound. Right. Yeah. So I think we're on the right side of that, I think, as time goes on and we confront those that want to forget that voice of that unborn child um 
I'm hoping our culture will recognize it for what it is. And it, and it's been very frustrating. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm sent down there to save a life or many lives or all lives. Okay. And we've had different legislation. This is where we have problems with in, internally is we have different legislation, such as a late term abortion mm-hmm. bill that we wanted to do. And the house was working with last year, uh, to try to keep out that murder out of our state, Dr. Mm-hmm. Carhart. Um, but if, you know, if I could vote on a bill that does end late term abortions, I will. I'm not done with my fight, right. but if I could save one child, I will. And I think it's very frustrating because they, the other side of this argument will say, well, listen, you're just saying it's okay for any babies up to 20 weeks. I agree that we should be saving every life, mm-hmm. every child, every heartbeat that's out there. But it, this is where we get into the problems internally on this abortion fight. And I wish we could all come together and just fight for each, you know, each Absolutely. and every child that's out there, even if it's a hundred or two hundred or a thousand, or, and or work one. our way mm-hmm. right, one. or mm-hmm. work our way. There was seven late-term abortions in the state of Iowa a year ago. To save seven, yeah, you know, save seven lives would be incredible. But mm-hmm. it's frustrating down there, and certainly until the Republicans get in charge, there probably won't be done anything done in the Iowa Senate. Uh, you know, and I know this really isn't a partisan issue. Uh, there's a lot of people on the other side of the aisle that feel this way as well. And, and I'd give kudos to Joe Singh. Joe mm, Singh absolutely. stood up uh, and he seems he's mm-hmm. pretty consistent on that yes. in the past. And there's been other senators as well. So being there nine years, really, it's a very important issue to me, if not the most important issue. And it's just unfortunate that this happens. Is there any chance, uh, of course, the legislative session, it, you guys are already on right. overtime. Uh, it was supposed to end last week. Uh, is there any chance of at least ending taxpayer-funded abortions this year? I don't know the status of the uh, what's going in conference committee now. Uh, well, they, they the, 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 the House has the House that. stripped it out. Uh, what I'm, I'm, you know, that I'm concerned about is we'll do the same old thing as what we did before. Is uh, they stripped it out last year? They couldn't decide on it, so they did a supplemental later on, and uh, so you could go home and say I didn't vote for. Uh, any kind of Medicaid or government dollars going towards abortions. Mm -hmm. Uh, But the House has stood strong. Of course, in the Senate, it's a whole different story uh, because we're a couple votes short. Right. uh, I do believe that uh, the end, uh, we'll probably do the same thing as what we did a year ago. It's And so basically it comes down to we need to pick up two more seats in the Senate. It is so important. We're talking to State Senator Brad Zahn from Urbandale and State Senator Ken Rosenboom from Oskaloosa. If you'd like to join the conversation, feel free. The number is 855-244-0077. Anything going on this week? I mean, it it seems like I know uh, Monday or Tuesday there there was a gavel in and two minutes later the House was done for the day and pretty much the same thing happened in the Senate. I, I know conference committees are meeting behind closed doors, but from your perspective... There doesn't seem to be a whole no. Lot there's going not on. much going on. I'm on a conference committee. We had an organizational meeting, I think, three weeks ago or two weeks ago, and I've not heard anything since. Um, I, uh, with the rookie status, I'm not sure what all is going on. But from my perspective, very, very little, and uh, and it's frustrating. I mean, I, I I guess I think that we had we had talks on budget targets three months ago, mm-hmm. uh, and we we all knew what the numbers were. But uh, here we are in overtime, and we still haven't uh, – I haven't seen real negotiations taking place. So. And, of course, you made the drive up today on your own expense because you're not getting the per diem or anything, uh, hoping something was going to get accomplished. Right. And uh, what happened today? Just tell us about what happened after well, you we, we, the Well, we gaveled in at 1130. We gaveled out, out at 1135. I uh, I went and talked to tried to find a few House members to see if I could learn something about what's going on mm-hmm. with uh, conference committees, but the place was pretty vacant. So uh, uh, the the most notable thing that happened today is I stayed around in Des Moines so I could be on Kevin Hall's show. <laughs> you know, I would thank you. I would say that we are no closer to be an other than I was a week ago sitting in this chair. Well, Not the, one bit. The leaders seem to express some optimism that maybe next week they could wrap things up. But from what I'm hearing, 
there still seems to be a, a huge divide between the Republicans and the Democrats and what they want to accomplish. I am session. going to guess we're going to be there more than another week. Really? Yep, that's my guess. Yeah. Wow. Um, let's talk about one thing that did go on this week. Uh, there's been a lot of hubbub, and this has been covered in, in the media, uh, with the Iowa Veterans Home in Marshall. Yes. Town. And there was a hearing on Monday. Monday. Uh, regarding uh, the commandant there at the veterans' home and some complaints about him, right? Uh, you're on that committee, so tell us a little bit uh, about that without going too deep. Into yeah, it. and it's it's uh, there are a lot of pitfalls there, I suppose, because what we heard Monday was two and a half hours of uh, largely uh, allegations against the commandant. I it, it's hard to sort through all of that. There was also some uh, some support expressed for him. He was able to speak for himself. He was at the hearing. Um, not that, you know, our veterans affairs committee doesn't have subpoena power. Mm -hmm. So, and apparently some written complaints have been filed with the DAS. Hmm. So I don't know where that will go. I've got my thoughts on it, but they, they're, they're not, uh, it wouldn't be wise to talk about that sure. now. I don't believe, uh, it's unfortunate. I, the governor did appoint, uh, Jody Timerson. Jody Timerson, mm -hmm. I think, uh, subsequent to that as what the chief operating officer I or believe something so. like that. Yep. Uh, which uh, I guess at least signals to me that there's an acknowledgement that we need to make some changes and uh, this will likely, in my judgment, end up with the government oversight committee who does have uh, subpoena power. And um, it's it just hard to know how, um, how to read all the allegations sure. because uh, uh, what one hears as uh, a tough management style and other hears as uh, – uh, well, some things needed to be fixed and changed there. So sure. some fine lines to walk, I think. Gotcha. And Jody Timerson, uh, former state rep from right. uh, down in Madison County and was <clears throat> leading the Department of Veterans Affairs. That's correct. Uh, and so now there's a vacancy there. Right. So you are watching the Iowa Legislative Hour. I am Kevin Hall and our guest this week, Senator Brad Zahn from Urbandale, Senator Ken Rosenboom from Oskaloosa. We'll be back with more of the Iowa Legislative Hour on Webcast One Live. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Drink, dance, party. Kitties is the ultimate dance club in Des Moines. A huge dance floor with room to move, three bars to keep your drinks full, and kicking DJs playing all your favorite dance music. At Kitties, we've always got your birthday party planned with Birthday Fridays. That's right, when your birthday rolls around, there's only one place to go. Gather up your friends and head to Kitties, where you drink free on the Friday of your birthday week. Find out more about Birthday Fridays at KittiesUSA.com. Kitties, all kinds of people, all kinds of music, all kinds of fun. Drug and alcohol addiction slowly steals a person's identity, tearing away pieces of their life little by little until one day it seems like the hope of a happy future is gone and there's no chance of getting it back. Here at St. Gregory Retreat Centers, we can assure you that there is hope. Our unique approach to recovery begins with the understanding that the dysfunction and damage caused by addiction can be overcome, not just dealt with. Don't let another day go by. Call St. Gregory today. Whether you're 10, 25, 50, 80 years old and beyond, everyone needs to live within their means. I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America. For almost a quarter of a century, we've helped people of all ages learn to manage their personal finances to benefit them far into the future. When problems arise, we've got the experience you need to make those debt problems go away. Got financial problems? Call Consumer Credit of America. And we're back on the Iowa Legislative Hour. Kevin Hall, along with our guests this week, State Senator Ken Rosenboom and State Senator Brad Zahn. Voter ID, this is a topic that's been kicked around uh, really since early 2010 or late 2009 when Matt Schultz uh, began his uh, campaign for Secretary of State. There was a vote on it on the Senate floor this week, and of course, as anyone could have predicted, it failed on strictly party lines, 26-24 all Republicans voting for it, all Democrats voting against it. Can Why do you support voter ID, if you could tell us that first off? Well, uh, common sense? It's, yeah, common <laughs> sense. Uh, you know, we all come up here to Des Moines. We all talk about common sense government, and and we all know what we'd do if we were uh, being able to call the shots. But 
Yeah, it is pure common sense, isn't it? I use ID for virtually everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's such a reasonable thing, isn't it? Isn't it very reasonable? Uh, we, we, we do hold voting, our voting rights in this country to be sacred almost. And, and as, as we should, and, uh, regardless of what the number of, of voter, um, how much voter fraud there is, uh, I think it's a simple, at least a partial correction to that. Yeah. Uh, not, well, it's not, a, it's another safeguard. I mean, of course it is. It, why not protect our you know, most basic right as U.S. citizens is the right to vote, or one of our most basic rights is right. the right to vote. Why not protect that and make sure that your vote isn't being suppressed by somebody, you know, fraudulently voting the other way? Yeah, and I guess it begs the question, why is that always a party line vote? That's what I don't get. I mean, why why not? do? And, you know, what I like, too, is State Senator or Secretary of State Schultz, he's tinkered with this. He's, you know, there's concerns. Well, what about people in nursing homes? Well, they've made accommodations for that. Um, you know, what about college and high school students? They've made accommodations for that where any, you know, legitimate photo ID can now be accepted. Brad, I mean, this is frustrating that this has to be a straight party line vote. Well, it shouldn't be. Uh, you know, one thing that wasn't said on the on the floor and Joni Ernst did a brilliant job of, of managing that amendment. Mm-hmm. But, you know, one thing about it is I think there was a poll in the Des Moines Register back in January or February. Iowans overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly really want this bill passed. 71%. I mean, yeah. And uh, so, you know, I got my eyes opened up when I ran for Congress. And uh, there was a lot of things that were going on, mm-hmm. especially around the Grinnell area. Uh, you know, and, and other areas of the state of Iowa where there was people that were voting that should, that were probably voting in two places. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it was very frustrating. We, uh, you know, it's, it's no secret. I mean, there has been people that have, uh, been convicted and at least tried and convicted, uh, that have tried to cheat the system and, Mm -hmm. and, uh, violate the voting laws we have in the state of Iowa. We have a great, uh, environment for elections in the state of Iowa. What we're basically saying is let's keep it that way. Sure. We don't want the Chicago style politics coming into the state of Iowa. And, uh, it was very frustrating. Uh, I was just really kind of surprised at the reaction when it was called on a record vote and everybody on the democratic side just kind of laughed like, yeah, bring it on. They, they claim it's, we're trying to suppress votes. We are not trying to suppress votes. We're just trying to make sure that everything's legitimate. I mean, Senator uh, Rosenblum talked about uh, all the IDs, you know, that you have to have for everything. Mm -hmm. You have to have an ID virtually for just about anything you do. To get it on a plane. Go to a hotel. Go anywhere. Go to a movie if you're younger. And and, Mm -hmm. uh, it's just unfortunate that that happened. Uh, But, you know, heck, uh, we're going to – that's another reason why we got to have two more people in the uh, Iowa Senate. we got to keep control of the House. It was no accident that Joni Ernst, a former county auditor, yeah. was passionate about this. Mm-hmm. As a you mentioned, I'm, I was a county supervisor. I would go into the auditor's office election time, and we would talk about what could happen, what might happen. I, I, I would challenge the public if they have questions about that. Go talk to your auditor. Uh, you know, do we have widespread fraud? Probably not. Are there ways to cheat the system? Yes, there are. Very, voter, very simple ways. Yes, very simple ways. Very, very basic things. Mm-hmm. So, uh, uh, so it's unfortunate uh, that we get bogged down in that, but that's where we are. And this was uh, the discussion on the voter ID bill was part of the standings bill. Uh, you guys were talking about this during the break. Some of the right. other things that were uh, brought up in that, did one regarding education. Yes. Uh, well, Senator Zahn should speak to this because he's had some really uh, innovative ways, I think, to to change education. And both uh, both of us are very passionate about that. But the the idea, and Senator Bain brought this forward, to uh, provide educational savings accounts so that the money essentially goes to the families, to the parents, uh, so they can educate their children as as they see fit. You know, it would bring it would bring true competition into the educational mm-hmm. establishment, which I think is uh, very much needed. Uh, homeschoolers, private schools, parochial schools, everybody being a level playing field. And uh, I, I guess I think it would just, as, as Senator Bain said, it would be revolution, not evolution. Very important in education. 
And Brad yeah, is it, you know, that is something that I'm very passionate about, and and uh, you know what this does is it creates uh, some of the market driven policies and and actions of the private sector. And that we're not trying to discriminate against public schools. We all know there's a lot of good public schools out there. What it does is it opens up the door. But most importantly, I can tell you, because I've studied this issue very thoroughly, uh, you know, your educational expense with federal and state dollars varies from school district to school district, private schools to private schools. Uh, And, you know, I can tell you that it is, uh, you know, in I I believe in the city of Des Moines, there's thirteen thousand dollars that are spent on each student. Wow! In the city of or the Des Moines school district, mm-hmm. uh, and then you go up to Ankeny, it's around ten thousand dollars. You can send your kids if you're a Catholic to Dallin High School for sixty eight hundred dollars. What it does is it allows you to figure out the best way to get your kids the best education. Uh, and if there's money left over at the end, you could apply that to one of our region's universities. So it can hmm. actually help Beautiful. pay for your, uh, your, you know, your, your college expense, take a little bit off your college expense. So I was really happy to support that. And, uh, and certainly, you know, there's some changes going on. You know, we had the announcement today that, uh, that the department director, Jason Glass is considering, uh, going out to Colorado mm-hmm. and, and, uh, so we have great opportunities here. That bill there would have been revolutionary. That bill right there would have been true education reform. And there was one Democrat crossover. Yes, I, was, I didn't want to leave that subject until the viewers knew that Joe Singh did support the Republicans on that amendment. And we had a 25-25 vote. Wow. So uh, there's a message there, folks, that we just need to work a little harder to get the uh, people that really want education reform into those Senate seats and let's get this, uh, we can, we can get some things changed. Any idea what's going on with education reform? I mean, this is, this is dragged on for a long time. The school districts still don't know what amount of allowable growth they're going to have. Uh, you know, the Repu- the house Republicans gave in and, and agreed to allow the 4% and the Democrat, you know, if you go along with the reforms we're proposing, of course, the Democrats rejected that. Any idea what's going on there, Brad? I, I don't think there's hardly any movement from what uh, Joni Ernst is our ranking member of education. I don't think there's very, very little movement. Now, a week ago, I thought there were, might, we might get this thing put together. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I don't see any changes in this last week. Um, you know, they're hung up about their issues. I just they're still hung up about uh, letting homeschoolers, parents, uh, teach their kids driver's ed. That's <laughs> one, really yeah. about the only part of the bill I like. I and, just uh, I don't understand that. What, yeah. Why why the opposition to that? Yeah. I, I I just I, I don't this get day, it. I can't I figure either. it out. We've tried to do this every year. I've been down there, uh, and you know, but what, you know, we'll have to see what happens. Hopefully, next week uh, some things will happen. And you know, here's the good news to all high ones out there: we are not getting paid anymore. And what that <laughs> does is like a pressure cooker, mm-hmm. and it starts people start getting really irritated i've been i've been there till june 30th right that was and, two years ago yes right. and uh people get really upset you know i've got a business and you've certainly got a uh, business got as well to do. and you got the, you also have the farmers right well, we haven't really had that pressure from the farmers yet because it's been so darn wet out and but once you know they're talking next week oh, that yeah. they're going to be in the field and then we're going to lose a lot of members and uh, the combination of the farmers being in the field and everybody driving down here and paying for their dime, but most importantly, the hotel expense and everything mm-hmm. when they come into town, uh, I think will add to the pressure. But, hey, I've seen it go till June 30th. I don't think we'll go that long. Uh, but we have got huge issues with property tax reform, not to mention all the budget bills. We only have one budget bill that's been decided, and that's a judiciary branch budget bill. Uh, the rest of them are all undecided. Wow. But these were all on the table in uh, late January, early February. Yeah, from the, know, from we, the beginning. Well, yeah. it, Brad, you mentioned property tax reform, and we talked about this before the show. Every single person on the ballot last year campaigned on property <laughs> tax reform. Every, I, th- I think literally every legislator in the state of these legislative forums, everyone that I went to, mm-hmm. they all campaigned on the need for property tax reform. And here we are. The session is already you know, you're past the deadline and nothing has happened. It doesn't look like anything's going to happen. Well, no, I, I'm still going to be optimistic okay. uh, that this might be the year because everybody campaigned on it. 
Uh, the big hang up with some of the members of the majority party in the Senate is this earned income tax credit. Mm -hmm. Hey, we voted for it. Uh, I, I believe everybody pays too many taxes, and, and certainly uh, the governor has been very resistant to that and actually line-itemed it last year. Right. Uh, so uh, they're going in pretty cautiously, but I still believe it might be a wimpy little policy, you know, uh, passage or tax property tax reform, but I still believe that we'll get something out. One thing uh, the Senate did vote to approve this week, $8 million for the Iowa Speedway. Uh, how did you guys come down on, on that we, issue? We did not vote on that. That was the Ways and Means Committee. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and you know that that is, there's a couple bills that are working the Ways and Means. One is oh, so that, so that one, has not passed the Senate yet. That's, that's correct. Okay. So it might have passed the House, but it does not pass the Senate on the Senate floor at least. Yeah. I I heard the report today. It must have passed somewhere, but I yeah, haven't. Seen I think it. it just came out of committee yesterday. Yeah. Okay. Um, I do believe you know the other thing is this. A hotel that they want to build downtown Des Moines. That's mm -hmm. another thing that they're talking about, where they create a zone like was done with the uh, the Field of Dreams, as mm -hmm. well as uh, the Newton uh, Speedway. Uh, that the good news with that is I've been harping about this, and I've voted against those other bills. Is this time they're finally going to put a, a procedure in place to be able to ask to have this done? Um, typically, I would be non-supportive of anything like this. Uh, but I've you know done some digging on the information here, and right now it's only capturing new taxes that come in, same as the Newton uh, Speedway. But in the past, if you've had a good lobbyist or a very influential senator or representative, you could get that through with no strings attached. At least they're going to put some guidelines in place on what projects qualify and what the investment will be by the locals and that kind of stuff. Uh, so that's another issue that we're going to probably be dealing with and, and – uh, but let's just hope we get some property tax reform yeah. done. Yeah. And this hotel you mentioned, my understanding is it'll be attached to the Iowa Event Center somehow. Um, I mean, what do you think? Do you, do you well, see yourself I, you know, supporting I that? Be, or? I used to be on the uh, Greater Des Moines Convention and Business Bureau, and I've met with Greg Edwards, and you know, obviously it was on his board. Uh, you know, great examples. We got the wrestling tournament here, which was great. Mm -hmm. Economic boom for the area. And there's other events that come here. Uh, we... Uh, they asked if the wrestling, you know, if the wrestlers would consider coming back to Moines. They go, listen, the city's great, the people's great, but I can't have my referees out at the uh, the hotel out on Jordan Creek, and and uh, so until you get a hotel there, mm -hmm. and this isn't just the only event. There'd be other events we could sure. get. Uh, we're not going to consider to coming back. So hmm. you know, it's kind of the only missing link from the Wells Fargo Arena, Hy-Vee Hall. Uh, but with that, it's not fair for me to say, well, if it's in my backyard, I'm going to support it. Yeah, I will support or th consider supporting something like this if there are strict guidelines in place. So it's, you know, if maybe, you know, Oskaloosa gets a good project, but guidelines in place, not just a powerful lobbyist or right. whatever. Right. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see what happens there. I do not believe that that got through ways and means. I think it's been worked on. Okay. I have seen some figures in confidence because I want to know how much the developers are going to be putting the money in and how much the taxpayers are doing and how much revenue it would ge uh, generate. One thing that I did not know is that only 4% of that money would go into uh, the project itself of just the just the hotel. Hmm. 4%, not 6%. Obviously, schools get one. The state gets 1%. Mm -hmm. um, so I did not know that. Uh, but you know, listen, we got to use our head and we got to be good stewards of the taxpayer's money. And, uh, I want to be fair. So it's, you know, fair and equitable for all of the state of Iowa rather than just a Des Moines, Newton, or, uh, wherever that field of dreams is. And what they're saying with the speedway and Newton, the one thing that they have, the one race that they have not been able to land yet is the sprint cup, which is the marquee, uh, circuit of, uh, of auto racing, obviously. So that's what they want to get there. Your thoughts on two million dollars a year for four years for the newton speedway well actually i didn't even know about that until i heard it on the news today i need to uh i'm not going to take a position until i've had a chance to okay. sort that through talk to some other folks so um yesterday mid-american energy announced uh they are going to invest 1.9 billion dollars for more wind turbines in iowa uh no state tax credits or anything uh, which I'm, I'm sure you're glad about. Of course, federal is, is a different story, but your thoughts on, on that announcement from yesterday. Brad, we'll start with you. I'm going to get myself in trouble here. Um, <laughs> I think it's great. Okay. $1.9 billion coming to the state of Iowa. 
My biggest concern, as it has always been concerned, is there's no grid in place to deliver this uh, this power. And I assume that grid will come. There'll be enhancements in that. But most importantly, that once the tax incentives go away, if we ever send people to Washington, D.C. that make the right decisions Talk and spend about less than they take in. The wind energy tax credit. Correct. Mm-hmm. And there's some state tax credits as well on indiv- individual projects. Okay. Uh, once those incentives go away... Uh, the wind industry is dead. And uh, so, you know, I'm a true believer in wind could, should be considered part of the solution. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we've got to talk about nuclear. We've got to shut, quit shutting down these coal-fired uh, these plants that we have throughout the state of Iowa. And uh, I truly believe coal and nuclear is the way to go. Yes, it's a great news for the state of Iowa, uh, but let's be cautious about it. And I always said all along that, we should be making all these people putting up these wind turbines to put a bond in place because once they uh, shut off all the money coming out of D.C., these things are inactive and eventually they're going to become a hazard. The argument for it is MidAmerican claims this will keep you know homeowners or utility payers bills will keep them you know stagnant without rate increases and uh, it'll help you know pay property taxes and whatnot. But the wind energy had you know they they've yet to show that that can stand on its own. It's not reliable. Right. Senator Rosenblum, your thoughts? Well, I I remember a conversation I had with my brother in Sioux Falls about oh, eight or ten years ago. He He's a um, CEO of a large bank in Sioux Falls and rubs elbows a lot with the folks from Poet and, and other alternative energy folks. And I remember him uh, quoting uh, one of those uh, executives as saying that uh, – you know, there's there's really no long, good long term answers in wind. Now, I don't want to sound negative. We're all for green energy. We're all for all of the above. But but Brad's right. You know, we uh, baseload energy. Uh, we're glad to have a hydroelectric uh, facility go into the Red Rock uh, area starting next year, which will uh, be a bit more stable, I think. But uh, but yeah, um, you know, green's the thing, and 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 that's all well and good. But uh, let's not build a house of cards here. Right. That's my concern. Gotcha. You're watching the Iowa Legislative Hour on Webcast One Live. More in a moment when we return on the Iowa Legislative Hour. Stay with us. Leach, owner and general manager of Service Legends. I brought uh, along a couple of the uh, home comfort heroes. (laughs) Hi, I'm Tammy Wells. I am Nick Wondershot. I'm administrative manager. I'm the senior technician. From Service Legends. It seems like every good thing, when you feel it to the bone that it's good, there's a lot of hard work put behind it. Just, I I don't think that you can fake it and have it turn out good. You know, if we seem like, okay, that's just weird, it's just a furnace, why would you believe so deeply in a furnace? It's not just that, you know, we want to show the world that you can have good service. Yeah, I mean, it's got to be, it's your home. You know, it's, it's built into our daily trainings, it's built into our culture. Um, that we're going to do whatever it takes to have each client say they love us, period. That's why we spend all the hours in the training that we do. And if we guarantee it's going to be a good experience for you or else it's free, what type of work do you think we're going to do? (laughs) There is a guarantee. Temperature selection guarantee, fixed rider it's free guarantee, comfort guarantee, best value guarantee, all of these guarantees hold us accountable to ensuring that we exceed your expectations. And if for whatever reason we'd fail and we can't make it right, We guarantee all of those guarantees with a 100% money back guarantee. I mean, if you don't think that your technician can fix it right, are you going to say that to a client? No. (laughs) You don't have to worry about having a technician come to your house. We drug test, background check all of our team members. We put safe people in your home. Each and every one of our service techs, 400 hours a year in training. You tell it the minute they walk in the door. They know what they're doing, they've done their homework, and they actually truly care about what you want. Because at the end of the day, you're the person that makes sure I have a job. They're going to be listening. They're going to want to know what your challenges are. Then they're going to come and give you options, and and you get to choose. If I'm there to help and I make it easy and painless, I did my job right that day. Well, when it comes to your comfort, safety, and your family, you know, you don't necessarily go buy the most expensive, but you get the most bang for your buck. Oh, it's worth it because there's a lot of people that will find a way to get it to work right now and then leave and then come back, charge you again, and, and the cycle just repeats itself. So when I'm out there looking at the furnace, I want to find why it failed the day. How can we change the part today with something that you're not going to have to worry about? Is it worth changing the part today? I mean, you can put a lot of money into a furnace. I can fix parts all day. There's good job security in that for me. But is it the right thing for you? I get a lot of the phone calls of after the technicians are there. They're just in awe. They're like, 
Wow, you guys are great. I mean, I don't even know what to say. You guys are great. Everything you did was perfect. It was great. <laughs> Keep going, though. I like this. <laughs> Just give us a try. I'm going to take all the risk. I've got the time to make this right. I've got the support to make it right. Just check us out. And if you don't see the value in what we do. I mean, fixed writer, it's free or 100% money back. Enough said. We are back on the Iowa Legislative Hour, our final segment with our guests here this week. Had a good time, having a good time speaking oh. with Brad Zahn and Ken Rosenboom, especially Ken. This is about <laughs> the most fun I've had all week long. Uh, well, we talked about a lot of issues already. Something, uh, Senator Rosenboom, you wanted to talk about, liability protection for farmers. What's going on? Well, with that? I came to Des Moines with, with this rather low on the list of priorities, I guess. And for me, it keeps working up every week to a higher uh, position because I think it's a big deal. Okay. Uh, in a Supreme Court decision, uh, Iowa Supreme Court decision last year, um, they struck down part of the liability protection that Iowa farmers have enjoyed for well over 40 years uh, when they have, uh, specifically when they have recreational activities on their farm, such as having, you know, the third grade from the local school come out or any number of things. And then, uh, while that court case did not strike down the protection on hunting and fishing, uh, I think a lot of farmers feel threatened by what did happen. So, um, and, and just for the, so the viewers know, there's, there's been in Iowa law for many years, some liability protection for rural landowners to uh, provide opportunities for the general public for hunting, fishing, recre recreational activities such as uh, mushroom hunting or, mm -hmm. and, and I've mentioned, uh, by the way, my wife found three or nine good ones yesterday. Um, <laughs> I'm leaving here and I'm going to do it next. Are you a big morel guy? Oh, I love it. Really? So anyway, um, uh, that was struck down and I, I'm afraid the, uh, the farmer's reaction is it's going to be easier for them just to say no to people that ask to come in the farm. Hmm. I think it's a big deal for, uh, I've done, I've hosted school children on uh, different farm activities. I've had, you know, not just school children. I've had Russians and Chinese and Japanese and just, just different groups that want to come to an Iowa farm. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's important in the age where people want to know how their food's grown. We, sure. we want to be transparent. We farmers who are very much a minority um, are, are glad to uh, show to people how we do things. But I think that's all being jeopardized here. So, and, and I think it's also important to note that this was never – Farmers don't want an economic benefit from this. This isn't about money. It never had anything to do with money. They don't get paid for this. But uh, but now if there's if, they, if there's a perceived threat to their uh, liability protection, they're going to be more reluctant to invite, you know, the third grader, you name whoever, to come on the farm. And hmm. uh, and so I think all of Iowa loses. I as I said on the floor, I don't think it's a Republican Democrat thing. It's not an urban rural divide. It's an Iowa deal. It's very unique. I think and was it, was this part of a larger Supreme Court case or it, do you know? Well, the, no. The as I understand it, the 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 decision was quite narrow, and I'm not a lawyer, but the decision was quite narrow. There was a lady that fell uh, through a hole in a, in a hay barn that had been covered by a bale, and okay. uh, she I think broke a wrist or something. She had some some medical issues, and and she sued. And, this, and that worked its way up to the Supreme Court, and they decided that Iowa law, uh, uh, which previously wouldn't have allowed her to sue, and mm -hmm. now they, they said no, that she should be able to sue. And uh, it, it's such a unique deal. It's, it's as I said, farmers, it's not an economic benefit for them to have anybody come in their farm. Um, but it's, it's simply a become a farm versus trial lawyer issue. Wow. And I think it's unfortunate because I think everybody in Iowa loses. I haven't figured out who gains yet by this. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Well, uh, Senate Republicans tried to give some gain to our brave military veterans um, by proposing eliminating the income tax on veterans' retirement benefits. And surprise, surprise, the Democrats shot it down. Well, actually, I'm, it was, uh, they didn't shoot it down. Wasn't that ruled uh, non germane? I don't think we took a vote I, on that. I think you're right. I think that was non-germane. 
but they, it did get it has been blocked it it yeah, uh, right. it passed out a subcommittee it was blocked mm-hmm. and uh but you know we're competing with other states for other things mm-hmm. including uh, a lot of states do exempt uh, military retirement pay from yeah so. well i mean that just again that's that's one of the things that seems like common sense to me yes and one thing, you know, all the years I've been down there, eight years, when it comes to veteran issues, military, and the people that serve our country, thank you, all of you that are listening, mm-hmm. um, we have always done things in a nonpartisan yes, way. Yes, both always. sides. Both sides try. We all get yeah. up there and support, you know, to try to help out, you know, create better opportunities when it comes to, you know, jobs or taxes or low interest loans or whatever that is. And, uh, and I salute you for your service to our country. Uh, but we've always done that. And I was really kind of surprised by that. Uh, let's just hope that next year we could get something done on that. Yep. Well, and it did die. You know, we, it came out of subcommittee because I was on that subcommittee. Mm-hmm. And then we never heard it mm-hmm. anymore until it came up in state. Well, they killed so, it. Yeah, they, so they killed wow. it. So there's some partisanship there, yeah. unfortunately. Amazing. Uh, we talked about this last week. And, Brad, you had mentioned that this was perhaps the toughest vote that you have ever had to take in the state Senate, um, a bill that would require DNA samples be taken from people convicted of certain aggravated misdemeanors. Mm-hmm. Uh, I believe when it when the House sent it over to the Senate, it, it was all aggravated misdemeanors, and uh, that was whittled down somewhat, but the more serious aggravated misdemeanors were kept in there. Uh, you voted yes on it. Mm-hmm. Senator Rosenboom, you voted no. I voted no. And why? Well, I don't know that I had a real clear path on that one i voted no primarily because uh i have a a problem i guess with government overreach Mm -hmm. whether it's traffic cameras or drones or any number of ways where uh big brother can watch and keep records and so forth so uh, not pretending to be any sort of sort of expert on that particular matter. I know there were safeguards about how they could keep the DNA. It just makes me a bit uncomfortable, I guess. Uh, yes, it makes them uh, probably get some, the, the uh, police, uh, some tools to work with. They don't have mm-hmm. but, uh, another crime solving. Yeah, tool. right, right. So there's some good in that, but, uh, I have some fear too with that type of thing. So. Brad, tell us again about this because you you really struggled with your decision. I waited till last minute, pushed my me and uh, myself and Jake Chapman did. Uh, really came down to everything he said, mm-hmm. but also if it could get a bad guy uh, and keep him from reoffending, and that was my biggest thing is the recidiv- recidivism that is goes on with these convicted felons mm-hmm. or um, you know. It would be the lower one we have in the right. state of Iowa, ag- aggravated assault. Um, but I just, I'm still today, you know, I did what I did. I, I'll stand behind my vote, but I just want everybody to know that it was something that was very hard to do. I agree. I, I don't want the government coming in and certainly don't want them to overreach. But then again, there might be someone that's innocent that's sitting in jail. Right. It could exonerate know, that could somebody. help them as well. So. Mm-hmm. I did it, and, and uh, hopefully it sounds like we're going to see it again. If they did make it better, uh, that interests me, and we'll have to look at that bill. Yeah. I think my understanding was the House approved what the Senate sent back, and so it is going oh, okay. to Governor to Branstad governor. now. Okay. So. I know the governor really wanted this, so uh, well, I assume he'll sign it. Well, let's talk a little bit about things going on beyond the state capitol. Um, one of your former colleagues in the Senate, Swati Dandekar, from out okay. in eastern Iowa from Linn County, um, was in the Senate for 2009 through 2011 and then left to take a spot. She was appointed to the uh, Board of Utilities by Governor Branstad. She's considering a run for Congress. As someone who worked with her and someone who did, ran for Congress not too long ago, what do you think about her as a candidate? Now, the Democrats aren't crazy about her either right now, and she is a Democrat. She, because she resigned right, and it gave us an opportunity to pick up a seat, which we failed to do, mm-hmm. uh, which would have put us in a tie. Right. Um, I, uh, Swati is a very nice person. She is very knowledgeable. I was happy with her being on the utilities board. She'd been very passionate and has stood up for issues that we talked about earlier that uh, we have to have you know, a diversification and not just rely on green energy. I've seen her break from... Uh, the Democrats on instances. I've also seen her walk the line Mm -hmm. with the Democratic platform. 
Um, and so she's a good person. I certainly think that she'd be a very formidable candidate. And uh, we'll just let the people of Eastern Isle pick out who they want. Obviously, I don't know that. Do we even have anybody? I'm not quite sure. Um, in the first district, we do not. Well, that's right. Well, they must not be doing a very good job if you don't know. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, we do. We do. Uh, Rod Blum yeah, right, yeah. and Steve Rochi. Yeah. And I don't know either one of them. I think I've met maybe both of them. But uh, we need to have a strong candidate over there. And maybe those two are the strong candidate. But I certainly am not going to be supporting Swati if she decides right. to run. And uh, but she is a very nice person. I'm, I still get confused with the whole redistricting thing. Mm -hmm. I, I was trying to think District 1, which, you know, used to be more southeast. Yeah, right. And um, yeah. so it's changed a lot. But, yeah, Rod Bloom, uh, who's kind of the Liberty candidate, and Steve Roch, who's mm -hmm. run for office before. And there's going to be – there's others talking about getting in. Paul Pate, former Secret That's Secretary right. of State, is, yep. is considering it. Uh, we haven't met. This is our first show since Steve King announced he was not going to run for mm -hmm. Congress. Your thoughts on on Congressman King or for running for the U.S. Senate? Well, I guess I'm a little surprised. Uh, although as time went on, it became pretty obvious that he wasn't going to run. Uh, I, you know, the two that names that are out there, or at least that I'm aware of, uh, Matt Whitaker. Mm -hmm. I think I could get excited about him, and mm -hmm. Joni Ernst has become a friend, and I, I have the utmost regard for. Joni Ernst. She's a smart lady. She's an accomplished lady. Common sense. Um, you know, she's the kind of person that we all should be glad to have represent us in Washington. So I just don't know Matt personally. So with those, you know, those that's a couple of good starters, mm -hmm. I think. So. Well, I just hate to remind you, Kevin, but I remember when I did the Insiders program and I said, the first thing I said is that Tom Harkin wouldn't be reelected. And, uh, he didn't run, mm -hmm. so he wasn't reelected. Uh, secondly, I said the Latham, King, Reynolds, of Northey, mm -hmm. all four of them wouldn't run, so it did not mm -hmm. surprise me. Uh, I do agree that we've got a couple candidates right now. Don't really know some of the other ones that are thinking about uh, running, uh, but I do know uh, you know uh, Matt really well, and I and I know Joni as well, mm -hmm. and I think they'll be good, very good, formidable candidates. Yeah, I agree. Any thoughts of reconsidering for you? Or no you? way, no <laughs> way. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be a dad and be a state senator. Yeah. You know, why did Why did you decide not to run ultimately? Well, ultimately, it came down to I was very close to pulling the trigger. Had the hmm. website set up, had my uh, fundraiser set up. You know, I mean, the fundraising group. Mm -hmm. I had uh, my consultant set up, and I went on a run on the weekend. I decided. You know, I don't want to put my family through that right now. Hmm. And, uh, you know, I've got a son that's going to potentially be playing for Iowa, and uh, I want to go to his games. I've got another son that is going to be a senior. I want to be around for his senior year. And I've got a, another son that's going to be a sophomore next year. Hmm. And my family is going to come before all that. And, uh, you know, those kids grow up and maybe someday, but – Absolutely no changes. I've had a lot of emails and phone calls from people in the last couple of weeks asking me to think about it, uh, but I am not going to change my decision. And I think uh, Congressman King didn't really touch on this, but I think he had some family considerations mm -hmm. there as sure. well. Uh, you know, as running for Congress, sure. that the Democrat attacks uh, are nonstop. I mean, you really got smeared uh, uh, by the Boswell campaign. Congressman King. Uh, when he was being challenged by Christy Vilsack last year, they had trackers oh, yeah. constantly on him. They had, this is a true story, before one of the debates, Congressman King and his closest advisors and campaign team, one of those being his son, and I, I believe the daughter-in-law was there as well, had a little prayer before one of the debates. The Democrat trackers stuck their cameras and microphones in there so they could listen to them praying, hoping they could catch them saying something you know, that they could use against them politically. I mean, yeah, I, I get the tracker thing, and, and I think it's it's a necessary tool in this day and age. But come on, while you're praying, mm -hmm. while you're you know doing private conversations, I mean, that's just ridiculous. I had it happen to me all the time. <laughs> and this is the reason why I said many times in debates with uh, uh, Leonard Boswell is that this is why people don't run. Mm -hmm. And it's disgusting what they do. Uh, we play by different rules as Republicans than the Democrats do. Have you guys been following the Benghazi thing and the whistleblowers and in that testimony that went on last week? Another case of we play by different rules. We've got 
Here are these people, these whistleblowers who are giving very emotional testimony and trying to get the true story out. And these Democrats are saying, well, you know, death is a part of life. So what? Mm-hmm. And I mean, I, I'm just blown away by that. Ken is a, Well, yeah, I, you know, I mentioned my son's a two time Afghan vet. Yeah. Um, my brother's a Vietnam era vet. My father is a still living battle of the bulge vet world war two. Wow. Um, I'm not a military vet. I talk to a military vet virtually every day, either my father or my brother or my son. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't in this country treat our military people and our ambassadors the way they were treated and be cavalier about that treatment. So yeah, it's a big deal to me. I'm, 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 I'm livid about it. I simply am. Yeah. We just, that's not how we do things like this. If, if we reduce these types of things to pure partisan politics, um, I'm going to be livid. Yeah. And, and I think the American people should be livid. Uh, uh, people uh, have to understand what this, how serious this really is. You know, we, some of us are old enough to remember Watergate like it was yesterday. And uh, Watergate was ugly. There, there was, there was a cover up. There was things that grown ups shouldn't be doing. Mm-hmm. And Benghazi is is also, I think, very much a cover up. Mm-hmm. We heard for 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 two weeks that this this movie was created. The this, uproar there. It this YouTube video not, that that nobody's ever seen. Uh, those were out and out lies. Yes. And the secretary, the ambassador to the United Nations, went on five. TV shows on a Sunday morning touting mm-hmm. that line. Folks, that's a cover-up. Yep. And uh, uh, we, we can expect better than that. And uh, so, yeah, uh, as a father of a, a, of a paratrooper, um, it's, it's too much. It's too much. But I think there's some good news that's going to come out of this. First of all, hopefully Hillary Clinton's campaign for presidency is over with. Okay, that'd be a good thing. It should be. Uh, It should be. You know, if this would have been President Bush that had this happen to him during his tenure. Mm -hmm. uh, The other good news is it seems like the mainstream mainstream media is starting to waken up to what's going on here. Yep. And uh, so uh, it's very unfortunate. I haven't watched all of it because I've been busy doing it. I had a concert I had to go to last night for my son. But I don't. I I'm 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 just sickened by what's going on there in Washington D.C. Listen, this is Chicago corrupt politics that are running our country, mm-hmm. and hopefully the uh, people of America will wake up and say enough is enough. On that note, let's wrap up the show, gentlemen. Thank you for coming in this week. This was a fun discussion. Hey, yes, thank you. Enjoyed you. it a lot. <laughs> Senator Ken Rosenboom from Oskaloosa, Senator Brad Zahn from Urbandale. I'm Kevin Hall. Thanks for joining us for this week's edition of the Iowa Legislative Hour.